And good morning. Hi, right, George. I'm a special broadcast this morning. <laughs> and for the next half hour, this is Gene Shepard, and we're going to look over the funnies. Uh, as you know, the uh, newspapers are not being delivered these days, and I'm quite aware that at least 75% of the Americans read the first thing, absolutely the first thing they read are the funnies every time the newspapers arrive. This is a known fact. And I am no different from all the rest of the world. And, and by the way, it's not just kids that read funnies either. It's people, real people type people. Every morning they sit and they look at their old Dick Tracy and they look at their old Blondie and they know that the world is going on just like it's always gone on and will continue to go on exactly that way. So good morning. Let's get after him right now. <laughs> I've gotten a little bit out of touch with Dick Tracy, but I've maintained a, uh, a kind of a writing correspondence with uh, Dagwood. Here now is Dagwood and Blondie, and this, of course, is from the Journal American. And uh, everybody knows Blondie. As a matter of fact, there's probably no more American comic strip than Blondie is, because a whole, probably a generation and a half of Americans have tried to form their lives around Blondie and Dagwood. Here's Blondie in the first panel, and she's looking at Dagwood, and Dagwood is looking very irritated, as Dagwood has looked for over a generation and a half. Uh, Blondie says, be a dear now, and run out to the market and get me some spinach, old boy. He's looking at the paper. And now he's getting real mad. He says, oh, for goodness sakes, come on now, will you? Blondie says, now here, I wrote it on a slip of paper so you won't forget it. He says, forget it, I can remember spinach. What are you talking about? Oh, boy. And so now in the next panel, the third one, he's at the grocery store. And the little grocery man is standing out on the street, and he's giving him his packages. And there's a nice relationship between these two. The little man says, yes, Mr. Bumstead. And uh, Dagwood says, thank you, sir. And now poor old Dagwood is walking down the street. He's walking past the fire hydrant. And in the background, you can see the sign says, National Bank. And off to the left, you hear the sound coming, bang, bang, pow. Dagwood says, great Scott, I hear shots. And sure enough, around the corner come this full crowd of cops. We know um, the uh, guy who does Dagwood and, and uh, Blondie has a very close corollary with the old Max Senate crowd. If you read Dagwood and Blondie, you are also looking at Max Senate. He almost always has the same crowd of cops and mailmen. And here you see, coming around the corner, a whole crowd of cops, and they're wildly shooting at a guy. <laughs> bang, bang, of course, and uproar is going. And the, and the crook is running down the street carrying a bag of money. When crooks appear in Blondie, they are real crooks. I mean, they have, they have whiskers, they have striped sweaters, and they have black masks on their faces. And he's running down the street with a bag of money, and of course it has a dollar sign on it. It says money. I have never once had a bag of money that had a dollar sign on it. But this guy has it, and he's running down the street looking desperate. And, of course, he's running right into poor old Dagwood, and the, the shots are going on. Bang, 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 and the next thing we know, Dagwood and the, and the crook are running down the street side by side, running in the same direction, away from the cops, where the shooting is all going on. And remember, Dagwood has in his hand a brown bag that looks exactly like the brown bag that the crook has. And the both of them are running down the street like mad. <laughs> a ridiculous comic strip. <laughs> and in the in the in the next picture, we see that they've both been captured now. The crook and poor old Dagwood are both being marched into the station together. They've got six guns in their back, and one guy has a gun pointed right at Dagwood's ear. One little short cop that looks like the middle guy that used to play. You remember the one with the handlebar mustache? He used to play in Max Center. Well, he's got his Roscoe right behind poor old Dagwood's ear. <laughs> and they're in the police station. And now they're taking away the crook. And poor old Dagwood is talking to the captain. He says, really, Captain, I'm as innocent as a newborn baby. Really, Captain? The captain says, okay, then, go on home. Wowie. And you can see both these brown bags over to one side, you see, where they've been set up as evidence. And now here is poor Dagwood. He's home. And Blondie has just opened the bag, and what do you think pops out of it? Spinach? Eh? Oh, no. No, no. $10,000 bills. 
a great big bag of money. She says, Dagwood Bumstead, how could you be so stupid? The poor Dagwood's walking away. He's got this funny look on his face. And even the dog is mad at him, which is true of Dagwood and Blondie. Everybody's mad at Dagwood at some point during any strip. So he's walking away, and he's got this funny look. I'm like, what happened? And sure enough, she has poured it all over the kitchen sink, nothing but a great big pile. Of, it, it's not spinach at all. It's cabbage, a big pile of money. She's poured it all over the kitchen sink, and the kids and the dogs and everybody else are looking at it. And Blondie says to the kids, in true wifely fashion, she says, I sent him to the store for spinach, and he comes home with a bag full of $100 bills. <laughs> And in the last picture, we see uh, Dagwood is running back to the police station. He's just outside. He's got a big bag of money. He says, well, at least it was green like spinach. Oh, boy. What a life. <laughs> Here I am reading the comics this morning. You know, this is a very interesting world. I, I'm, I'm out of touch with the comics. And all of a sudden, all these people I used to know a thousand years ago are all of a sudden creating before me. Have you ever felt like you were living in a comic strip yourself? I mean, that you're in the next panel, and a thousand, maybe a million. You know, Dagwood doesn't know that a million people are looking at him, or a billion, or whatever it is. Maybe you're in a comic strip and don't know it. For example, here's Beetle Bailey, who's always in the Army. He's been in the Army for years. And uh, this is one of the great GI strips that has been part of the American comic strip tradition for about the past 10 or 12 years. And here we see in the first panel, we see this friendly little lieutenant, a little lieutenant, and he's got his, his red and white helmet on, and you can see his bar hanging down there in the front, and he's talking to the captain. He says, I can't find, I can't find your attack orders anywhere, sir. You can see that it's a night attack scene, you know, they're having a maneuver. And the captain says, gosh, I have to know what time to attack. He's looking at his watch, and they can't find the orders. And now the captain says, Beetle! Take my jeep and ask the general, and don't stop for anything. And poor little Beetle Bailey is in his fatigues in the background. He says, yes, sir. And then in the third panel, we see the captain talking to the lieutenant. And in the foreground, we see that the jeep was taken off with Beetle Bailey in it. And the captain says, hey, I remember. I put the orders in the jeep. And the lieutenant says, we can catch him on the motorcycle, sir. And there we see in silhouette, a beautiful drawing, we see Beetle Bailey going like mad in the Jeep. He's going so fast that the Jeep isn't even touching the ground. And we see way in the background these two officers running like, like mad. And they're actually, they're not running at all. They're sitting in this motorcycle. One's in the sidecar, and one's driving the motorcycle. And Beetle Bailey says in the foreground, Hey, ha, oh, look at that, they're testing me. They're going to see how well I do. They're testing me. And we hear that the eyes are... The captain and the lieutenant are hollering, Stop! Stop! Bailey, stop! <laughs> and then in the uh, the bottom strip here, in the lower left-hand corner, we can see the rest of the troops with the sergeant. And the sergeant is talking to the rest of the troops, and they're looking at they're looking at Beetle Bailey in the uh, in the jeep. What's going on in there? Beetle Bailey in the jeep, and the uh, captain and the lieutenant who are following him. You see the great cloud of dust. And the uh, sergeant says, he's looking through field glasses, he says, Holy smoke! The attack must have started! Great Scott! And now, and now, things are heating up now. We're going up the chain of command because we see the major now. The major's wearing a blue and white helmet, and he's got a great big major leaf on the front of his hat. And he is talking to the general. Now the major says, General, look! And the general says, What's the meaning of this? Of course, he's getting mad about this because you can see everything's going on. And in the last picture, you see the whole army is assembled. Cannons, airplanes, ground troops, the whole crowd. And you can see poor little Beetle Bailey in the foreground with his jeep. He's talking to the general. He says, we want to know what time to attack, sir. And he's leading the whole army. And the general is really sore about this. His stars are just gleaming in the dark. And he says... Did all of you have to come and ask me? All of you? Hmm. Hmm. That isn't the kind of army I was in. <laughs> That's Beetle Bailey. Let's see what we've got here now. These these are these are from um, this is from the Journal American. 
And uh, let's we'll see what else we've got here. Good morning, everyone. We're looking at the comics here, seeing what's going. What else do we have in the Journal of American? Uncle Remus. Uh, believe it or not, I'll tell you one thing that's in Believe It or Not. There's a rabbit with two tails. This one was uh, submitted by uh, Mrs. Edward Haynes of Louisville, Ohio. You don't know about that. No, I don't see the little king here. No, the little king is not in Jane American. Oh, no, Siri Bob. I don't see it. Where is it? No. I'll tell you one of my favorites. Do you mind if I do Snuffy Smith? This is this is one of my old favorites. You know, Snuffy Smith, Fred Laswell. Uh, he's one of the one of the old time comic strip artists who believes in being funny with his comics, and he comes off with some great ones. Uh, one of the all time great comic uh, panels was done, uh, strip panels was done by Fred Laswell a long time ago, and it showed Snuffy Smith sitting on the porch of his house. You know, his little cabin out in the woods. He's sitting there, and he's just rocking. And uh, and uh, he's just smoking his pipe and paying attention to nobody. When all of a sudden you see striding past his house this great big figure, a giant figure of a man. And he was wearing long Arabic robes. And he had on one of these, you know, one of these Arabic long flowing capes. And he had a great big kris, which is an Arabic knife, hanging down by the side of him. And he strode right past little old Snuffy's cabin. And while he was striding past, he turned up and he looked up at Snuffy and he says, Hello, Snuffy. And Snuffy looked down and says, Hello, Fred. And he just walked right on past. And we hear in the house, Loisy, you know, Loisy, what's her name? Louisy? Louisy, his wife. His big fat old wife hollered, Wasn't that your brother Fred? Who's disappeared 30 years ago? Who's never been seen again? Snuffy says, yep, yep. She says, where was he? Where was he all this time? For heaven's sakes, where was he? Where, wh what was he wearing that suit for? Where's he been? He said, I never ask a man his business. <laughs> and then the last panel, you see, you see, poor old Lois, he is sitting out on the porch waiting for him to come back, and the moon is hanging. She says, I know he's got to come back sometime. That's one of the all-time great ones. Let's see what Snuffy's doing today. Here's Louisa in the kitchen of their little old house, and she's talking to Snuffy. She said, we better shake a leg, Paul. We aim to get over to the lead betters by supper time. And Snuffy says, let's go, woman. All I got to do is whistle up old bullet, and I'm ready, Ma. Let's go. I'll whistle up old bullet. <laughs> and, and, and Louisa says, thunderation, I hope you don't aim to drag that old dog along with us, Paul. No, he says, I sure do. He's part of the family. What do you mean? Mammy, he's part of the family. <laughs> and now, Louise, she's got her she's got her Sunday hat on, by the way, which is a great big pile of flowers on the top of her head. And she's got a shawl around her ears. She's all covered with flowers. She says, Land of Goshen, have you forgot? Did you done tell what he done to Miss Ledbetter's flowers the last time we took them over? You know what he did to her flowers, Snuffy? We can't take him over there today. Nuffy says, shucks, he can't hurt them none this time. They're all dug up. He dug them up himself. And then in the fourth panel, <laughs> she's really despairing. She says, an old bullet scared her hands so bad they never laid area egg for three solid weeks, Snuffy. Snuffy's now laying down the law. He's a different stripe from, from, from Dagwood. He says, he's still going, woman. He's going. And then way down on the bottom there, she's she's really despairing now. She's beginning to appeal to his better nature. And besides all that, it's ten mile or better over to the lead better, Snuffy, and he's so old and creaky. We can't take... Snuffy says, yep, you're right. You're right as rain, Ma. It's too long a walk for poor old bullet. You're right. And so in the last panel, we see old Bullock, the old crummy hound dog, is in a wheelbarrow. And who do you think is pushing the wheelbarrow ten miles over to the Ledbetter's house? <laughs> Poor old Louise. She says, one day I'll learn to keep my tongue atwixt my teeth. And Snuffy's just up in the front there walking along as happy as you can, 
as happy as you can be, and he's carrying his jug, of course. He wouldn't go to the lead betters without his jug on a Sunday. He says, dodge them big rocks, Ma. Old Bullet don't like jogging. <laughs> Fred George, he represents the other side of married life, this guy. He takes charge, man, when you have to take charge. <laughs> Snuffy Smith. Let's move on here now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Here's the little king. You're right. Here's the little king in Journal of America. This is Otto Soglow, who long ago established a whole style in, uh, in the cartoons, also uh, particularly, of course, in the New Yorker. And he made a whole series of wonderful little king animated cartoons that are still being shown on television. And some of, they're, they're funnier than many of the things that are still being done today. The little king is, is, is lying in bed, and he looks very troubled. And he's in this big, beautiful king bed, you know, with the things all hanging down. And that, uh, we see now he's ringing his bell. He's got a big hand bell, and he's ringing it. And, <laughs> and his, his manservant has, has, has uh, come to his bedside, and his eyes are closed, and he's looking very official. And the little king is pointing off in the distance. He wants something. And now we see the two servants talking, and one servant says to the other, Fetch the royal sheep counter. His majesty can't sleep. And in the next, in the next uh, panel, we see this guy coming, dressed in, a, in soup and fish. He's walking up to snuff, or he's walking up Little King's bed. And he's beautifully dressed. And Little King is lying there now, and he's turned over on his side, and the man is standing behind him. In fact, he's, he's uh, standing next to a great, big, beautifully carved chair, and he's counting sheep. One, two, three. Remember, the king is a king. Everything is performed for the king. Ladies and gentlemen, he, he's, <laughs> he's counting sheep. One, two, three, four, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six. Now we see the little king has begun to doze off. But we also see that the man is beginning to get circles under his eyes. Seventy-two, seventy-three, seventy-four. And, of course, in the last picture, the little king is sitting up wide awake, and his sheep counter is sound asleep. <laughs> so they had the little king. I'm telling you, this is a wonderful world. I, I, uh, let's see, I think we ought to get out to one of the other papers now. How about the Herald Trib here? See what's, see what's cooking in the Trib. How about Miss Peach? That's always pretty good. Mel Lazarus, who lives over in Brooklyn, I believe. Occasionally, he's a listener to my Sunday night show who calls up once in a while. And here's, here's Miss Peach, and they're all sitting around in school, and there's a great big sign on the board. A big sign says, Parakeet Fund, give this boy a bird. And the little kid who's going to get the bird, he's just sitting there looking self-satisfied, and all the kids are raising a fund to buy him a, a parakeet, apparently. Well, the little girl is counting how much she's raised already, 294, 295, 296, 297, 298, 299, obviously their money is in pennies. And all the kids are cheering, three dollars, yippee, wowie. Now the next panel, they're giving him the good news. The little girl says, great news, Arthur. We've collected enough money to buy you a brand new parakeet. And one of the other kids says, now you won't have to pine for Tweety anymore. Obviously he's lost a parakeet. And now down in the, down in the, uh, Second second strip, we see that uh, Miss Peach has arrived. She says, what's all the excitement about, class? And the kids say, we shipped in to buy Arthur a new parakeet, Miss Peach. And one of the little girls says, and Ira went to the pet shop to get it. Now there's a big sign hanging behind him that says, welcome, Arthur's new parakeet. And one of the kids says, here they come now. And sure enough, the kid has arrived with a green parakeet. <laughs> And uh, and uh, little Arthur is standing there. He's, he, you can just see that he's emotional about it. He's meeting his new parakeet. And the little Iris says, uh, "Arthur, meet your new parakeet." And now there's this beautiful panel where the where the meeting is being held, where Arthur is meeting his new parakeet. It's a lovely scene, beautiful scene. This is an actor's studio scene, right down the line. And uh, Arthur is looking very, very soulful, and the parakeet is looking kind of mad. And the parakeet turns around and says to Ira, is this him? And Ira says, sure, that's Arthur. You're going home with him. Go ahead now. And the parakeet says, hmm. And now he's looking very irritated. He says, well, come on, let's go. 
Well, now they're walking down the street, Arthur with his little parakeet. And Arthur says, I think you'll be very happy at my house. Parakeet says, well, all right, I'm dubious about it, though. And now in the last panel, we see Arthur. He's crying again. And you see that his, his cage, his bird cage is there, and the door is open. And on the bottom of the bird cage, a name has been written. It says, dubious. <laughs> And Arthur's mother and father are talking, and the mother's crying. She says, my new barricade is gone, Arthur, and he, he left a note for you. And here's the note that is left in the cage. I am reading the note. I'm quoting it uh, verbatim. This is the way a parakeet writes. Dear Arthur, I am leaving because I have been gypped in two respects. A, you hardly talk. B, you, uh, you do absolutely no tricks. This is not fair to me, and I'm going to give the pet shop man a piece of my mind. Goodbye. Signed, dubious. <laughs> Parakeet people are special people, believe me. <laughs> uh, that was Miss Peach. How about Mr. and Mrs.? This is another old-time strip. They are now at the movies, Mr. and Mrs. This is another uh, kind of a milk toast type thing. And the, the usher says, sorry, folks, no immediate seating. And the wife says, what? But there must be. And uh, the mister says, it's okay, we'll wait, we'll wait. It's all right, don't, don't get excited. And now we see the wife is rushing down the aisle. She has spotted a seat. She says, Joe, I see two seats up front. And the poor old mister says, huh, huh, where? Well, what do you mean, what do you mean? And now we see him. He's fighting, trying to get through this crowd. They're trying to get through, you know, all the people are sitting there and people's hats are flying. He says, <laughs> sorry, folks, excuse me. <laughs> and you, you just see her foot in the, in the picture. She says, hurry, Joe, come on, let's go, get on the ball. And now here they are. They're sitting, and they're right down in front. And the poor old mister is looking straight up in the air. And he says, I, I can't see from this angle. What, can you see this? What are you talking about? And she says, no, I can't see either, but don't worry. I'll just keep my eyes peeled. We'll get another seat. And now we see in the, in the next panel, she has leaped up, and she's running off to another place to sit. She says, there are two people leaving in the back. Come on, let's go, Joe. And poor old Joe says, what, what, where? And he's still trying to see the picture. And now here they are in the back. <laughs> what a scene this is. There's a guy trying to tickle a great big fat girl. <laughs> what a great scene. And they're trying to get past him. He says, come on, don't. I, I don't want to. Please, Vi, please, don't. This is the mister. And she says, of all the nerve, look at those people. And sure enough, two people have just rushed in. A great big fat girl and a little skinny guy have just rushed in and sat in their two seats. She says, of all the nerve, those people just grabbed them. Now, if you'd only hurry. You're so slow. And now she's spotted two more. She says, look, look, quick, up front, quick. There are two more. And then you hear people from all different directions say, sit down, will you, for crying out loud, we can't sit down, will you? And poor Joe says, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure there are two? And in the last picture, they are sitting just exactly where they were in the beginning, right underneath the screen. She says, oh, these are the first ones we had. Well, I'm sorry, I'll keep looking. He says, don't bother, just make me up when the picture's over. Don't bother. And that's the end of that scene. <laughs> Frozen in life. Don't you wonder what people in the comics do after they after they leave the last panel? Where do they go? Do they carry the fight on? And what were they doing just before the first panel, you know? I mean, we've captured them right in life there, right in the middle of something. <laughs> How about B.C.? That's kind of a new comic. I don't know this one very well. B.C. apparently has to do with, with uh, ancient man. And uh, B.C. opens up with a very clever... I like his uh, his uh, name panel because he has it sort of like a Rosetta Stone. Uh, he has a big piece of clay, and on, on it is carved B.C. by Johnny Hart. And it's funny how many people will uh, look at comics all of their life, kids and people and grown-ups and adults. But you know, the comic strip is an American art form, truly. Uh, no other country has ever carried the comic strip to the extent that the Americans have. And there are many people who feel that the comic strip really does represent the popular literature of the 20th century and all the little prejudices and all the wishes and desires and stuff of our time are, are actually mirrored in these things. And I agree to, to, to a certain extent. I think that this is true. But maybe a hundred years from now, people are going to 
look back at these things and collect them and examine them and find out what we really thought. And here, here is B.C. You see this little caveman, and he's climbing up a long hill, and he's, uh, he's looking very dedicated, and he says, it's the least I can do for the human race. This is somewhat of a philosophical cartoon thing. It's the least I can do for the human race. And now he's finally right at the top of this mountain. You see him. He's standing right on the peak, and he's looking around. He says, besides, this may bring me a lot of prestige. And now he's saying, he's shouting. He says, hear ye, hear ye. He's hollering to all directions. Assemble ye together. Converge thee all upon this foothill. And now he's looking down, very satisfied, saying, he says, here they come, every last mortal of them, here they come. And now he's walking down the hill towards this great crowd of cavemen, and he says, he's talking to them, he says, thou art indeed fortunate this day, for I have the rarest of treats in store for thee. And all the cavemen now are standing around him, and he's standing on a rock, and his hand is up in the air, and he says, I have decided this morning to pass on to you all of the knowledge that I command. And one of them in the back row says, What will we do this afternoon? That's all. <laughs> this is mankind all the time, you know. Bertrand Russell gets up there and tells us how to live, and then somebody in the back of the crowd says, Well, yeah, but what about this afternoon on board? What am I going to do? <laughs> That's a very interesting strip. That's B.C. by Johnny Hart. What I was trying to say earlier was that it's interesting how many of us live with the, with the comic strips with us all the time, but rarely know anything about the people who draw them and create them.